totally good. Just scoot out. I was told that you would like me. <laughs> and the reason that you would like me is because I am from Idaho, I am from Boise, and we humiliated Virginia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't recover the next year they were beaten by a high school team or something. I don't, I don't know. They said if we'd have only beaten Penn State the same year, you'd have given me the keys to the to the entire state. We, we don't we don't we don't we don't play. No. Anyway, I am uh, proud and privileged uh, to be here. I've had a wonderful day. Uh, today, uh, with the job squad, and we, and we uh, went and got one of their clients, uh, uh, a charming young lady uh, who uh, uh, has a disability and wants very much to work. And we hit the mall <laughs> and uh, decided we, we wouldn't leave until she had an interview. And we, we, we went and went and went. And in the end, I think, uh, I know we have one. I think we may have as many as three interviews for the young lady. And, uh, I, I managed to only make one employer mad during the whole thing. <laughs> just, I'm just thrilled. That was really interesting. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a very different kind of, kind of speaker. I, I don't give anything that would look like a classic oration. All I'm really able to do is tell stories. And if you don't mind and you would indulge me, uh, I want to tell you a few stories. And uh, a little bit of the stories of my life, uh, but that seems awfully indulgent of me. I promise to try and make the stories of my life relevant to you in some way. How's that? First of all, I was I was raised poor. How many of you were raised poor? See your hand, you was raised poor. All right, good. Now the rest of you, if you, if you feel bad because you weren't allowed to vote here, uh, if you weren't lucky enough to have been raised poor, uh, at least how many of you were raised poorly? Any of you raised poorly? <laughs> I was, I was raised by my grandma in Portland, Oregon, and uh, she has been on welfare so long, she called it relief, and uh, this is before the days of food stamps. I don't even think they have food stamps anymore, I think they give you little food debit cards or something, and, uh, but before food stamps, we had food. Does anyone remember food? Who remembers food? Okay, how about this? Who remembers this? U.S. Department of Agriculture surplus food commodities not for resale. Remember that one? Well, you are the true pork. Who remembers the cheese? Remember the cheese? Oh, yeah! That's the best cheese I ever had! And I have been to France. So prove it. What did it look like? What was the shape? How big was it? Yeah! Yeah! In, in, in deference to Barry Bonds, it was Velveeta on steroids. <laughs> and and I, was, I was very poor. And uh, I remember when Grandma first uh, got food stamps, we went to the grocery store. And you had to have two little piles of food, one that you bought with money and the other you could buy with food stamps. So everyone knew who the food stamp people were because we were the ones with two piles. Anyone remember that? Two piles. You say, what does this got to do with anything? When I was in high school, I was an a orator. I, was, uh, I did a lot of speech tournaments. And since I was only a teenager, you know, I, 
my brain wasn't working and no, nothing up there was actually connected to anything else. So I have no ideas of my own. So every teenager must steal their ideas from somewhere else. And I would read quote books and, and quote uh, great Americans and, and whoever I could find. My favorite person to quote was always uh, uh, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens. I thought he had the best quotes in the world. My favorite Clemens quote was, they asked him once, would you rather go to heaven or hell? He said, heaven for the climate, hell for the company. <laughs> <laughs> but the quote that had the biggest impact on me was actually from someone called Oliver Wendell Holmes, a great American jurist. And what Oliver Wendell Holmes said was this. He said, most people go to their graves with their music still inside them. You think that's true? Yeah. I think it is. And it seems sad, doesn't it? Uh, but I'm a yin-yang kind of guy. I think that for every bad thing, there's somewhere there's something good if you look long enough. And, and I've looked for the good in that quote for years. And I think I know what it is. First of all, we all have music inside of us. Because if we all didn't have music inside of us, how could we go to our graves with it still inside of us? And some of us can find our music. And we know that because if none of us could find our music, then we'd all go to our graves with our music still inside of us, not just some of us. Some of us can find our music. Some of us can find an instrument to play it upon. Some of us can find a venue to play it. And some of us will find an audience that will come and listen. But what's the point? And some of us go to our graves with our music still inside of us. Quotes don't mean anything until you research them further and find out what was said before and what was said after that little tagline. And here's what Oliver Wendell Holmes said about this quote. He said, he went on to say, the reason we go to our graves with our music still inside of us is not that we can't find it, but that we don't look for it because we don't believe we have it or we don't believe it is worth playing. That's so sad. In our world, there are a lot of people who will go to their graves with their music still inside them. Among the people that will do that in disproportionate numbers are people with disabilities. Not because they do not have music, not because they cannot find it, but because they don't believe they have it. And to some degree, society doesn't believe that their music would be worth listening to. You are gathered here tonight, and in your presence here, you have made a powerful statement. And I believe you're saying right now that people with disabilities have music. It is worth listening to, and there is no reason for any of them to go to their graves with their music still inside them. I, I believe that in order for you to find your music, you must believe you have it. You must believe in yourself. And I truly believe that in order to believe in yourself, someone first must believe in you. So I ask you to consider a question tonight that perhaps you weren't expecting in coming to hear me. My question is this, who believed in you? Who believed in you, not when it was easy to believe in you, who believed in you in those time in your life when it was hard to believe in you? Who believed in you 
when the people who believed in you were ridiculed? Who believed in you in spite of all the available evidence? <laughs> who believed in you and would not stop believing in you? And how important was their belief in you to your eventually coming to believe in yourself? My grandma believed in me, and I didn't know that until we went to the supermarket. And when we went to the supermarket, I had, well, the cereal that you could buy with the food stamps was not good. It was, in, it came in large bags, had no flavor, and floated. And there were no prizes in it, none. How many remember prizes in cereal? Who remembers bringing cereal home and opening it from the bottom to get the prize? I wanted Tony Tiger cereal. Because you know what Tony Tiger had in it? Green rubber army men. And I was poor, and it was the only way I was going to get any kind of soldiers was to get Tony Tiger cereal. <clears throat> How many remember green rubber army men? Stupidest toy ever made. <laughs> Do you remember the shapes? Do you remember them? Do you remember the... Uh, 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 here's... It. Good grief. Rifleman. <laughs> I was in Vietnam, 68-69. I gave the keynote address, Vietnam Veterans of America, this year in Tampa, Florida. I had a t-shirt on that some of you would have liked. It said Vietnam Vet 68-69. And on the back of it it said Dow Chemical is not done killing us all yet. <laughs> In all the time I was in Vietnam, I never saw one soldier stand up to shoot anybody. <laughs> Are you nuts? <laughs> one of my favorite, of course, was Grenade Guy. Remember Grenade Guy? Grenade Guy had his arm like this. He had the grenade like this. He was standing up. Think about it. If you are close enough to the enemy to throw something round at them, why would you stand up and put your arm in the air? Bad idea. But the dumbest of them all was Bayonet Guy. Now, I, I could have appreciated Bayonet Guy if he'd had the bayonet and was ready to stab somebody with it. But Bayonet Guy had the rifle over his head. Oh, remember this? Holy yet! Man, that guy bothered me for years till I figured out that it was really okay. Man, that guy was just a French soldier during World War II. So I just turned him around backwards and had him surrender. <laughs> but Grandma said we could get Tony Tiger cereal. I thought it would be the best cereal day of my life. <laughs> and we had our little piles. And we went to the check stand. And everything was going to be fine. 